Who is Secret Asian Man? Tak Toyoshima, the artist who dreamed up the idea, has the answer. He'll discuss it next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is the role of cartooning in today's world? Tak Toyoshima, the artist creator of the Secret Asian Man comic strip, believes it's a combination of entertainment and education. Welcome to the show, Tak. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in cartooning. I think I've always drawn, and uh, <clears throat> there are some parts of the, uh, the walls in my house to still prove it, <laughs> about this high off the ground. Uh, I think once I started, I used to read comics all the time when I was a kid, uh, both American comics and Japanese comics. It was a nice kind of blend of both. And uh, the moment I realized I think I wanted to try comics as a career, or actually do more than just draw for myself, uh, was sometime after college when there was a huge boom in the early 90s when there was a big independent comics kind of surge and suddenly artists and writers were just creating their own comics and putting them out there, putting them up on shelves right next to Batman and Superman. So that became kind of the goal, the immediate goal for me <coughs> uh, to be up there. And uh, a local publisher called New England Comics who had been publishing The Tick, which is a very kind of a, a spoof kind of superhero book um, that I loved in college, was looking to relaunch the line. So. Uh, they called around to all the stores. They also had retail stores that sold comics, and they called the one that I happened to go to all the time. And one that I had just happened to uh, ask them to put one of my little Xerox copy comic books up on the shelf that I got 50 cents for every time they sold one. Um, and uh, the p publisher asked the managers, do you have any customers who draw comics or who might be interested in working on the book? Uh, so he said, yeah, well, you know, give Tak a call and see what see if he's interested. And I remember getting that call on a Saturday morning <clears throat> and, um, hey, you know, this is the publisher of New England Comics. Would you like to work on The Tick? And I was just kind of quiet for a minute. And I was like, did he just really say that? And he <laughs> said, yes, of course. And so that's kind of, that was my introduction to formal comics industry, uh, as they call it. And I uh, did that for about five years and um, did a lot of work, worked, uh, realized how much work it took to produce a comic month after month after month. Uh, but then after going to several conventions, comic book conventions and things like that, uh, it was great for the ego to kind of have, sit at a table, have your name, have people come up and ask you to sign things. And that, that felt good and it kept me going for a while. <clears throat> it made me start to realize when you know, a guy would show up, and if you know anything about Tick fans, they're a very special breed, uh, showed up with you know, a Tick hat, Tick bag, Tick toy, and said, can you sign my toy? And uh, I said, well, you know, I didn't really have anything to do with making the toy or anything like that. He's like, oh, that's fine. Just you know, write, sign it on the chest. And uh, it was at that moment where I was basically signing my name on this thing I had nothing to do with that I felt like I was just kind of a part of something and I wasn't necessarily having my own voice. So that's when I started thinking about, well, if I were to have the chance to do my own thing, tell my own stories, what would that be? And so the best stories that I knew were my personal stories. Growing up in New York City, uh, one of the only Japanese kids in Chinatown, uh, and a lot of interesting things kind of happened. And so I decided to use that as my story base, created Secret Asian Man, the character, designed, and uh, that's where that took off. Tell us about the informal influences on your career and what some of your favorite comics were growing up. Uh, growing up, I definitely loved the Hulk. The Hulk was one of my favorites. Uh, I just loved the sheer power that he had, and just it was very uh, neat to see him destroy things. <laughs> I think that's what I just really liked. Um, but I also liked the more street-level characters, more kind of not ridiculously powered, um, more like Iron Fists or uh, even Spider-Man to a degree, where they dealt with real issues. Um, and that was interesting to me early on. Now, were you aware of the lack of diversity in comics growing up, and was part of the reason the Hulk was of interest was because he was different? <laughs> well, I wasn't green, but I was. I, there was definitely something that uh, attracted me to that comic. Um, 
I don't think I was conscious of it necessarily. That's not what drove my decision to pick up which comics. But there was definitely a time when, kind of more in the uh, my tweens, when I started noticing, when I realized there was something called back issues, where you get older comics, and really looking at all this, these gigantic walls, and they reminded me of the wall of presidents in my classroom, where every face seemed to be just a white guy. <clears throat> and suddenly I looked at my comics and said, whoa, I'm reading this uh, in comic form. Uh, and so that's when I started actively seeking out minority lead characters. And, and how far have we come in, in that regard? Uh, I know we have a lot more diversity in comics today, but are, right. we're, are we there yet? Uh, we're definitely not there yet. Uh, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, just more recent things, there have been uh, Marvel's made a conscious effort to switch up a lot of characters, and so they gave us, now we have a female Thor, uh, Wolverine is going to become a female, there's a Latino Spider-Man, Nick Fury is black. So there is a lot of that uh, thinking going on. There was a gay wedding. Um, so it's definitely on their minds. But at the same time, a lot of those things can be seen as uh, not putting the investment towards creating brand new characters that happen to be these races, but just kind of repurposing already established characters. So that's a one criticism of those moves. Why is it so often that new characters evolve from male characters, so you get a female version of the male character? Is, right. is it part of the same issue? Uh, I think so, and I think it's, it's part and parcel of just, in the end, it's what sells the most, and it's kind of a chicken and egg game where you say to them, well, you should do this because people will buy it. Well, we don't do this because nobody's buying it. Well, nobody's buying it because you're not doing it, and it just keeps going. And you know, it just takes slow progress where one it happens once, and then it happens twice, and it just keeps on going. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We're, we're you know feeling out that process. Well, tell us about Secret Asian Man specifically. How did you come up with the name, and what what is the reaction generally to it? Because it, it evokes something that a lot of people are familiar with <laughs> in, in a different incarnation. Right. Uh, definitely, Secret Asian Man has a lot of meanings that it's taken on over the years. At first, just from my point, uh, it was based off the song lyric, mm -hmm. the, oh, the misheard song lyric of Secret Agent Man. Uh, and I just thought it, it rolled off the tongue, Secret Agent Man. But then it started developing into secret meaning an invisible type people, where largely we're voiceless in things like politics and on screen and in TV, um, in culture in general. But when we were there, it was more as a foreign entity. You know, here we're an import or something exotic, um, but not necessarily part of the fiber of American culture. Um, and so that's pretty much the, where the Secret Asian Man name came from. Uh, when it was picked up for daily syndication in United Features, uh, I definitely wondered how it would be received by just editors across the country. Uh, to even just to have a title of a comic strip that had the word Asian in it. And so um, that was interesting to see kind of happen. But to their, uh, to their credit, I didn't get much, much pushback on that. They said, just you know, keep the name, we'll sell it. So, Does that help with the distribution and audience internationally? I think so. One time I did a strip where I actually posed the question to the readers. Should I keep Secret Asian Man as the strip name, or should I just shorten it to something like Sam? <clears throat> it would be a lot more accessible. It's just a name. It's less threatening, I guess you could say. Um, and so I got deluged with emails on both sides, with really good arguments on both sides. So ultimately, I was left to make my own decision. And uh, I did stick with the name. I kept it a Secret Asian Man. Uh, on the one hand, it was keep it, be true to yourself. That's what you called it. Why change it? you know, they'll get used to it. The other side is, yeah, get successful, get to a position of power where you can, you know, enact more change. And so that was another uh, route to go. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just happened to chose the, fir the first option. <laughs> when did you first begin to think about education as a part of cartooning? I think it probably started when uh, I was working at a kindergarten for my work study in college. 
and just working with the kids, uh, with the preschool actually, uh, w working with the kids, just doing their artwork and you know seeing how big they made their heads, seeing how, <laughs> if they had fingers, and all these little things, kind of coming to learn that they had some significance, and so there was a psychology involved and um, you know just communication involved. So I think once I uh, saw that, it kind of lit something and that paired with just around that time where those independent comics were booming, a lot of new, brand new stories were coming out and some were, were not superhero comics, they were just completely different uh, style comics, life-based comics, <clears throat> and uh, that attracted me. So that's kind of what made me think of, huh, you know, what kind of life stories can I bring? And then that became just kind of a more of a natural extension of education, just to you know, bring that to a classroom. And, tell a story and then suddenly kids are telling you stories and huh maybe I'll teach how to do comics so that they can create comics and kind of go through the same process and exploration I did. And you're still in the classroom, tell us about that. I teach uh, at the South Shore Art Center um, up in, um, in Massachusetts and uh, it's a Saturday morning class, six week program <clears throat> and it's middle school kids so it's or roughly 12 to 16 has been the age range and the kids are tasked over the course of six weeks to create their own original characters, uh, create a storyline, and execute the comic. So it's half a drawing class, but then half storytelling and getting an idea down on paper. And what I found is a lot of the kids will, or some of the kids will just have the standard superhero, punch him out, kind of a comic strip. Uh, and, but others get a lot deeper, and they start to, I think, feel uh, they're pouring themselves out onto the page, and the stories that come out there, sexual, uh, gen, uh, gender identity is one of the uh, more common themes uh, right around that age, which kind of makes sense. And so I feel like there's a, a, a freedom in putting these feelings down on paper so that the characters can act things out. Oh, it's not me, it's, it, it's, it's the character. Mm -hmm. So then I could then ask them about their character, what would you do, what are the motivations, and I think they're surprised at some, a lot of the support that the other kids also give them. Um, so, you know, and that's a very empowering thing. So I, I look forward to those Saturday classes. Presumably these are kids who want to be there. Correct, yes. Okay. <laughs> so they're, they're interested in this, maybe even thinking about pursuing it as a right. career. And, and not all of them are artists. Mm -hmm. Some of them are literally stick figure, but it's, again, more about the storytelling, too. Because you can have the most beautiful comic book, but if the story's bad, nobody's going to read it. Um, so, yeah. What's the most surprising thing you've seen from one of these middle school students? I've been surprised at a couple of their sheer artistic ability. Some of them are so good at age 13, 12, far beyond where I was at. <clears throat> so that gives me, you know, really good hope. Um, and you know, and, and hoping that they also continue on, that somehow they're not in a system that discourages that or discourages continuing that ability. Because to me, drawing is just like writing. And I think people should write more and draw more, if at all. Some people just don't draw. If you ask a lot of people, grown up adults, to draw like a dog, they'll probably draw it really close to the last time they drew a dog, which is probably sometime in school. So it's, you kind of atrophy those, those artistic uh, abilities. And you know, I think it, that's just a whole other mode of communication that you can use in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of people associate comics with younger people. Sure. And, and yet there's a huge audience for them among people mm -hmm. of all ages, especially if you go to some of the conventions, right. you see that. How, how do we get away from the idea that it's just something for the young? It's definitely got a challenge <clears throat> in that pers uh, the per perception of it. Uh, I would say maybe more so in this country, because in other countries it is far more widely accepted. Uh, you go to any you know, Japanese train, you see businessmen reading comics, uh, and it's natural. And it's not about superheroes, they're just you know, reading about judo or th the office, and those are the kind of subjects. So I think uh, U.S. comics are definitely going through, there's, there's far more variety now than there was even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a large benefit, and I think you know, it'll just take time to have people absorb that. But I think that's why getting into the classrooms, libraries, uh, things like that are crucial because then that will naturally put it into that, the kind of that pipeline of, of literature um, and you know, normalize it, for lack of a better word. And, and part of the reason that there's more attention on comics these days is that, that 
the generations that grew up enjoying them are now adults mm -hmm. sure. and working in productive capacity. So they're, they're, they're actually driving this. Right. I mean, they're they're living out their nerd fantasies basically <laughs> now that they have the power to create a movie or anything like that or or start a publishing company. Um, they are not, you know not in a position to do that, uh, and I think that's great. So it, I'm dying to see what happens with this next wave. Uh, you know, their kids, the kids who grew up being forced to wear Batman shirts and going to go to comic. You know, will there be a backlash and suddenly they don't like it as much? But um, I don't know, if you go to any comic book convention, it, it's it's clear that there's far more adults now getting fully dressed up and having a lot of fun with it uh, than there used to be. So I think that's good. Talk to us more about the educational benefits. I think people can understand if you're teaching mm -hmm. young people how to draw and, and how to write a little bit associated with that. But right. what else can we teach in, in terms of cultural consciousness, uh, diversity, et cetera? I think uh, comics, because the themes have widened uh, a lot, uh, there's pretty much no subject that you can't incorporate comics with, including things like math, science. Uh, it's not just a literature uh, tool, uh, and certainly not just an art tool. And I think that's one of the hurdles it has, is most people, if they accept the idea of comics, they'll probably put it in some sort of art curriculum, which is fine, but it's also uh, communication has a lot to do with it. Uh, social justice studies, history, biography, um, any number of subjects can be tackled through uh, comics. And you know, the trick with teaching kids, you know, and I think any parent would know, is uh, the more a kid feels like something is being impressed upon them, the more they're probably going to turn away from it. And you know, perhaps there will be that backlash, but even if a teacher hands you a comic book to read uh, for a class, but I think that's why getting it in think places like libraries where they're free to choose um, would be a huge benefit. When you travel, what is the typical reaction uh, by, by your audiences? Because uh, you, you, you present all of this in, in sort of a subtle way mm -hmm. uh, because you, you're trying to let the audience become aware of what you're saying kind of on its own. Right. Definitely, uh, after most presentations, we'll get a, a surge of people coming up and saying, I used to read comics too. And it's almost like a confession and a, you know, like a little secret uh, that they used to read. And they immediately go after their favorites and uh, kind of tell s personal stories about them, uh, which is great, because there's never been a presentation where I did that and nobody didn't do that. So to me, that's a good sign that at least people are reading comics. Um, it's also nice to hear comments like, uh, you know, uh, I never thought of it that way, or I never thought of comics in that light. Um, a woman appro approached me today about uh, how her daughter loves to draw comics. <clears throat> and uh, after I had talked about using comics to kind of um, as a therapy kind of a uh, tool, um, she kind of just nodded her head and said, yeah, you know, maybe I'll try that with my daughter because, you know, my daughter hates homes, homework, but she loves to draw comics. If there's any way I can tie the two together. And so she texted her daughter and I guess her daughter said, no, yeah, that, that sounds interesting. I might, maybe I'll give that a try. So if I have, you know, if I'm helping one girl with her homework, that's mission accomplished. <laughs> Are you thinking of teaching at higher levels? You started with the, the, the youngest and then now you're with middle school. Is, Teaching at the college level is something you've contemplated. Uh, I've taught, when I first taught, it was in the preschools. Uh, through my job, I've worked with a lot of college students, but more in a design kind of angle or illustration. I do a lot of illustration portfolio reviews up in Massachusetts uh, for uh, senior illustrators. And then uh, I've worked with some high school kids, but I never worked with this magic middle school age. Mm -hmm. And I do think having kind of jumped around a little bit, that's where a lot of these things are formed, um, just kind of like the, the, the love for that medium, specifically uh, comics. And I don't know if that's a result of a lot of comics being geared towards that age, um, but there definitely seems to be a surge of things like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, where it's basically tying in images with words. Uh, and it's you know not a new thing, but I do definitely think there's a lot of uh, new interest uh, out there at that age range. But in terms of, uh, I think at some point, at a college level, maybe beyond that, uh, there's a danger of becoming too academic and forgetting the fun of it all. And I like to have fun with it. And you know, to me, a, a stick figure uh, cartoon has as much to say as a 
beautifully rendered one. You talked about how comics are appreciated more by adults in mm -hmm. many foreign countries. Um, when you travel abroad, uh, is that something that drives the conversation? I definitely don't travel as much as I would like to. Uh, I would, I'm looking forward to taking my kids to Japan mm -hmm. just to experience that. Um, I would love to travel to uh, South America to kind of see what the culture is down there. Uh, even in just doing general research for comics around the world, it's everywhere. So uh, my interest is where the energy is in those. A lot of them do the superhero thing. A lot of them export or import uh, Marvel comics, and that's kind of what you see mostly on the shelves. But I want to see what the what the independent, you know, artist who's producing comics in all those countries are. Uh, in in one way, I think they'll be very unique. In others, I think it'll help show how tied in we all are and how you know relatable these you know seemingly foreign stories really are to us. How do you draw? Are you rigid in terms of your work, <laughs> or are you inspired and work at different? Times. I tried at nighttime, generally is the best time to draw. Um, and I try to schedule out as much regularity in drawing just to force myself. And that was the benefit of working on a syndicated strip. You had to produce. And so after doing it for three years, I just looked at a mountain of work that maybe I wouldn't have been able to do had I not had this deadline under me. Uh, so I try to do that. It doesn't always work. Um, and life gets in the way sometimes. But uh, I think that. Um, you know, currently I'm working on a graphic novel that I want to try to launch in the spring. So I've kind of given myself a rough deadline, and um, you know, I, I think sometimes you need that. You need to be your own whip cracker to to make yourself produce. <laughs> How do you remain creative? Does it just happen, or do you have to work on that as well? For Secret Asian Man, a lot of it is uh, critical of pop culture, news, current events. So sadly, in some ways, there was always something to talk about, mm -hmm. something to always criticize. But in terms of just thinking of ideas, I feel like there's not enough time to put them all down on paper. Uh, and especially something in a medium like comics, where it's very work intensive, especially if you're writing, drawing, inking, scanning, look, shopping for a printer, doing the whole thing. Uh, it takes a lot of time to produce something, so it, it takes a good chunk of uh, your you know, of dedication to really finish it. A lot of times with comic strips, we see politics sort of creep into them. Is, is that something that mm. you like playing with, or do you make an effort to keep politics out of yours? I, I, in some ways, I think it's unavoidable to include some politics. Uh, it is avoidable to uh, exclude politicians, specific instances and things like that. Uh, I think you can have discussions like that without bringing up specific representatives uh, of certain points. Uh, you know, others do. But uh, I find you, what you want to do is, if you have a message, what you don't want to do is shut the door to that conversation. Um, and a lot of times, even in things like diversity, when you bring it up, you know, diversity can be a divisive word. And as soon as somebody hears diverse, you know, uh, diversity, they may roll their eyes, and a whole chain of events happens in their brain that, you know, that they disagree with just even the concept of it. So instead of doing it that way, it's more better to kind of, you know, effortlessly almost uh, um, yeah, put it in their subconscious that, uh, you know. Create a character that represents your point of view, but isn't a symbol of that ideology, because you'll tend to turn people away. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today, Talk to you, <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.